all the praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, the lectionary puts us Psalm 145, and so I want us to read this. Um, we're going to read the whole psalm. Don't worry, it's only about 20 verses, 21 verses. Um, so we're going to read this whole psalm, um, but then we're going to talk about who wrote it and where it is and all that. So let's read one, Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation command, commends your work to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All of your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time, and open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all that he does, and faithful in all, that, or in all of his ways, and faithful in all that he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears the cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked, wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak of praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Um, many of us look at the book of Psalms and we may read through and maybe read our favorite ones and kind of skip through. Um, we kind of look at the book of Psalms as, a, as this book of random writing in random orders. But if you read the Psalms all the way through from beginning to end, you'll see this pattern has emerged out of the book of Psalms. It tells the story of God's people from beginning to end, from creation to uh, exile, um, on through the, the splitting of the kingdoms and the second exile. The pattern we see in the book of Psalms is the story of God's people. Um, in Psalm, well, to kind of point out a few places, in Psalm 107, they're coming out of captivity. We're talking about coming out of captivity. Um, after the split of the kingdom and after they've gone into exile um, in, in uh, Babylon, Psalms 113 through 134, they're talking about rebuilding their worshiping practices. Uh, and the last Psalms in the book of uh, Psalm, 
is through 145 through 150 are all psalms of praise. Um, they say things like, we sing a new song. His praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Now I understand that the psalm we have for today, Psalm 145, is the psalm of David. Now David, in the timeline, is before the split of the kingdoms. He reigns as the king before that. But the people that place these psalms in order place his psalm towards the end. And there's a reason for that. Um, this psalm that David had written is so placed in the book five of the psalms. So this post-exilic period and the story of God's people. So, God's people had been exiled and have now been allowed to return to their land in their, after their captivity. Um, and then we have these psalms of praise. And we kind of go, oh, that's an odd place to put psalms of praise after they've just come out of captivity. They've just rebuilt. They've just started going back into their worship practices. Why do we have this, these psalms of praise? And it may seem odd for it to be the scripture that we have in the lectionary this Sunday. Um, we've gone through these past few weeks, and, and every week it kind of hits on something, and maybe God has been speaking to you about things that, that he is pointing out in your life and saying, hey, this needs to change, and we can do it together. And so we've kind of been in this, this place of, of this deep thought and, and repentance. And now the lectionary gives us Psalm 145, the psalm of praise. So it seems odd, but I don't think it is. Um, the Israelites... In the time of the story, if you look at Psalms from as their story, the Israelites in this point of time would be trying to find their identity once again. Um, they would no longer be where they once were, but they wouldn't necessarily be where it is that God wanted them to be yet. I think the point of this psalm being placed right here where it is within this larger book is, should be and is a reminder to us that even in the times of uncertainty, God is worthy of our praise. As I said before, this is a psalm of David it was written in a, as an acrostic, so um, the first line started with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and on through. Now, some of the translations don't have uh, Psalm, uh, well, verse 13b, the last part of that, and that would be the letter. Um, they brought that in after seeing the Dead Sea Scrolls and seeing that that was there. So NIV puts that in. Other translations don't. So if I read, if you have something other than an NIV and you read through that and I read something that wasn't in your Bible, that's why. Um, as we've said, or as I think I've said, acrostics are a good way for people to memorize things, right? Uh, if you have... If you have letter by letter, you kind of start to remember, remember that. Um, and that, there's a reason why this is written as an acrostic, right? So that they can memorize it. Some Jewish people still to this day um, go through and say this prayer, the Psalm of David. We see the theme of this psalm is a praise or glorifying God. And I don't think that we can look at this text... Um, Psalm 145, and just look at it just being what it is without looking at who wrote it, right? 
This is a psalm of David. David, if we remember his story, trusted God in his youth so much that he took on a giant with a stone, right? David was the anointed king, but once he took the position, David didn't always act in appropriate ways, right? We can all agree to that. David took advantage of his position to take advantage of Bathsheba, and David didn't trust God at one point and counted his soldiers. Remember that story? David also had times of repentance and approached God knowing that God was approachable. David, who came through so much, is saying in this psalm, even in the times of uncertainty, I will praise you. I will extol your name forever and ever. Extol is one of my favorite words in, in, in the Bible. Because it means to praise enthusiastically. So this isn't just a, I will praise you. This is, I will extol you. I will praise you enthusiastically. Can you imagine the images of this psalm brings to mind in the larger story of the book it's reminding us of? in the larger story of the people of God. The Psalms have brought us through this story, and here we are, God's people are finally where God locationally wanted them to be all along. They were rebuilding um, their places of worship. They were rebuilding their worship practices, and there's this feel of uncertainty to all of it. And those that placed these writings in an order decided to put David's psalm of praise right there. And I feel one of the reasons that, he does, that they did this was because sometimes in the midst of uncertainty, we forget to praise God. But even in the times of uncertainty, God is worthy of of our praise. David brings up that one generation tells of what you, God, has done and tells it to the next generation. Telling our kids how we've seen God working in our lives is an act of worship. It's a praise to God. The biblical text tells us that if we don't speak of God's goodness and praise him, the stones will cry out, right? If we don't do that, all of creation will just do that. In Romans 1.12, it tells us that all of creation reveals the qualities of God. The story of creation the Exodus, those were all oral traditions passed down from generation to generation. And now we can pick up a book and read about them. But even if you can't read about them, or even if you can read about them, it's always such a wonderful thing to hear the stories of how God is moving in people li- people's lives out loud, right? from the people that it's happening to. Much like family stories, we need to pass down the stories of what God has done in a family because those stories remind us of who God is and what all he has done. And when we do that, when we do what David had expressed is telling from generation to generation, when we do that, We remind the generations that even in the times of uncertainty, God is worthy of our praise. Another point we see in the psalm is sometimes in the midst of uncertainty, we forget God's qualities. David reminds us, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love, 
The Lord is trustworthy and faithful. The Lord is righteous. That's what David's telling us. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to sing 10,000 Reasons, right? He's rich in love and slow to anger. Those are some of the lyrics to that song. Those stories of, that the generations before us have told us remind us of who God is. The story of David is told, and it's a reminder of who God is. It's a reminder that even when we fall short, like David did, even God does not, right? Even when we fall short, God never falls short. Even though we might go down the wrong path, God is still trying to bring us back to where he wanted us. His qualities are that he's trustworthy and gracious and compassionate and rich in love. And we praise him because of who he is, not because of the situation that we're in, not because of our circumstances. So I'll say it again. Even in times of uncertainty, God is worthy of our praise. Another thing we might see in this psalm, another point that we might see as we read through, is that Sometimes, in the midst of uncertainty, we forget that God loves us. Like David, like I said before, we might have times where we fall short. Maybe there's a something in this season of Lent, something that we've gone through, something that's gone in, in the devotional, something that God has pointed out to you, that a place maybe you're falling short. And maybe that's really hard to accept. Maybe it's something we don't necessarily want to work on. Maybe to move forward in the way that God wants you to means making some drastic life changes. And maybe, maybe in the back of your mind, as you think about this, you think that these life-changing these life changes that you feel you're called to make are ridiculous because no matter what, you're never going to be good enough. The adversary likes to do that to us. The adversary likes to tell us all the time that we're not good enough for God's love. But the truth is that God loves us. The adversary tries to make us believe that we aren't good enough, and no matter what it is that we do, we're never going to be good enough for God's love. He tries to make us believe that no matter what our next step is, it's going to be the wrong one. But that's not true. God loves us, and if God is guiding us, that next step is the right one. God's love for, uh, for you, each one of us need to take this internally. Each one of us need to think about this. Not just us, but you. God's love for you spans the gap of your failures. No matter how small this step is that God's asking you to take, I encourage you to take that towards God. His love for you is deep and is wide and spans the gap of all of our failures. And that is why, even in the times of uncertainty, God is worthy of our praise. Here in a moment, we'll take communion. Elaine, do you want to help with the cups? Here in a moment, we will take communion, and I want to remind us all of the scriptures that come after that meal on that night. After that meal that he shared with the disciples on that night, Jesus visited the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed. 
And Jesus knew what was going to happen and why it was going to happen. God had, give, had revealed that to him. Jesus also, he knew what this meant for the world. And in the time of uncertainty where Jesus was saying, I don't know, if this cup can be taken from me, please take it. Even in that time, even in that time of uncertainty, Jesus prayed God, or praised God and said, not my will, but yours be done. All are welcome to eat of this table if you acknowledge your need for a savior and you don't have to be a member of this church and you don't have to want to be a member of this church. We just, as long as you acknowledge that need of a savior, then you are welcome to join us in this meal. We do this to remember where God has taken us from where God is with us right now, and where God is leading us to. I pray that we internalize what God has taught us today and that we go out into the world and we share that love of Christ with others. Let us pray together. Holy God, we gather at this, your table, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. We know that Christ healed the sick and fed the hungry and ate with sinners and established a new covenant of forgiveness for sins. We live in the hope of his coming again. And we eat of these elements as a reminder of what was, what you're currently doing in our lives, and what is to come. We pray, Lord, that you continue to remind us that these sacraments are a sign of a covenant that we have with you. And Lord, we pray that you continue to guide us, our minds and our hearts in this time. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. Eat this in remembrance. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the blood shed for you. Drink it in remembrance. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we gather as this, the body of Christ, to offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. We pray, Lord, that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these, your gifts to us, and make them by the power of your Spirit to be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be. For the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, Lord, we pray that you make us one in Christ and one with each other and one in the ministry of Christ to all of the world until Christ comes in that final victory. We pray, Lord, 
that you continue to speak to our hearts in this time of Lent. And that even though there may be places where you have pointed out to us that we need things that need to be changed in our lives and a different path that we need to be on, Lord, maybe they're small steps or maybe they're radical large steps. Lord, I pray that you continue to speak to our hearts about that, continue to guide us in that path. And Lord, I pray, I pray that you just continue to teach us how to follow you and what it is that you want of us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you just continue to give us the strength to go down the paths that you have for us, Lord. And that even in those times where maybe we feel uncomfortable or things look uncertain, that we're reminded that even in the times of uncertainty, we praise you. We know you're faithful. We know you love us. Lord, I pray that you just continue to guide us, each individually, and as the body of Christ, as a church together. Lord, we just love you. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You guys are free to go.